everyone. This is um, the Women in Science series, and today I have a huge pleasure to talk with Jacqueline uh, Mitten, a British astronomer uh, and author of many books bringing astronomy to the public, both adults and uh, children. Um, hello, Jacqueline. Thank you so much for joining me. Today. Hello. Uh, today uh, we are going to talk. Uh, I hope it's visible. We're going to talk about uh, your latest book uh, about uh, an outstanding American astronomer, Zira Rubin. Zira Rubin Alive, this is the title of the book. Uh, and it's a truly fascinating story and a page turner. I loved the book and I really highly recommend the book to everyone. So um, I think it's uh, worth talking about um, this um, fascinating person and uh, the book itself and the story of uh, the history, a little bit of about the history of astronomy as well. Um, and uh, first of all, I would like to quote uh, Vera uh, Rubin. Um, this is uh, something you uh, quote in your book. There was nothing so interesting in life as watching stars every night. This is uh, one of the things she said of her childhood years. And um, when did that passion uh, actually start what what sparked her desire to to become an astronomer well the right the way vera recounts this is it was when she and her family moved to washington dc and uh, she and her slightly elder sister <clears throat> had a um, a bedroom that had a window facing out to well it, it must have been quite open to the sky because um, she said that her bed was right up against the window and she could see through the window and she began to notice the stars there and what she noticed was that if uh, if she looked at different times of the night or even on, on successive days that the stars the patterns of stars that she recognized had actually moved around the sky so she had this realization that the sky was turning around the north pole of the sky uh, and the, the stars were there shining. This is amazing because uh, it, the, the sky must have been a lot darker in Washington than it is now. <laughs> we're talking about when Vera was what, perhaps 12 years old or so. So, um, uh, so we're back in the, uh, in the 19, uh, 1920s really. And, um, so uh, uh, that was really the starting point. She also says that she saw meteors, shooting stars, and that she would try and remember where she'd seen the shooting stars and plot them on a, a map of the stars and so on. So it was something that, that really grabbed her and um, got her started. Mm -hmm. She was quite lucky, I think, because in, in all her aspirations, she had so much support from uh, her parents, um, her father, especially, who was an electrical uh, engineer. He helped her at some point uh, build a homemade telescope. Yes, Vera describes this and she was very keen to get a telescope. Um, and, and indeed, her, her father was very supportive. Um, not only that, he he accompanied her to meetings of the, uh, the local amateur astronomical society because he wasn't sure about letting his teenage daughter go, go alone, how safe that was. But Vera describes how um, they bought a lens for, by mail order uh, and um, they uh, that she actually got a tube by going to a shop where they sold carpets and floor coverings and bought back a great tube on a bus. <laughs> And then her father uh, helped to lash up a wooden uh, a wooden tripod. And um, sadly, the, the telescope um, didn't meet the promise uh, that she'd hoped for, and uh, it, it was not that easy to use. Not surprisingly, um, but at least uh, it was um, it, it was something that that uh, every aspiring young astronomer wants is their own telescope. <laughs> and she yes, that was how she got it. As a teenager, she had a number of role models and probably one of uh, the first role models, uh, one of the 
first, if not the first inspiring figure uh, that she looked up to was uh, Mariah Mitchell, um, who in the second half of the 19th century had taught at uh, Vassar College where Vera obtained her bachelor's degree. And so who was Mariah Mitchell? Well, I'll say a word or two about Mariah Mitchell. It's not clear from what um, uh, Vera wrote herself and, and, and uh, how soon she became conscious of, of Mariah Mitchell as a uh, as a role model. Um, in fact, she doesn't talk a lot about women role models. She, in fact, she she says that really she didn't have any. She she didn't really know. I think she probably found out about Mariah Mitchell a bit later on when she was looking to go to college, and then that's when she she discovered discovered her so in fact um as far as uh, as vera was concerned um astronomers were men <laughs> uh, so but fortunately this didn't put her off uh, she did know that women could be scientists and there was a family friend who would they were mathematicians and um uh, and so on but um when she was looking for somewhere to go to college she did she certainly by then became aware of um mariah mitchell who was the first um, professional woman astronomer in the United States. Um, amazing, uh, um, a person of, uh, well, I think of the same sort of character as, as Vera, if I can say that, uh, a whole century earlier. Um, born in Cape Cod in 1818 from a, a member of a large Quaker family uh, and her, her father um, as part of the, um, uh, she was actually on the island of Nantucket, when I say Cape Cod, um, it, it was the island of Nantucket where um, the, the main business was whaling and a maritime um, uh, community. Uh, so there was a call for people who knew about telescopes and how to regulate clocks and how to look out to sea and so on. So her, her father knew about observing and he was also very much in touch with the astronomers at Harvard College Observatory. So there was a connection there. Uh, but out of all the, the family, uh, Mariah was the one who took to the, uh, to the observing. She learned from her father uh, and they had a rooftop observatory. Um, and perhaps not, uh, she wouldn't have shot to fame in the way she did, except that in um, 1847, she discovered Comet. And there's a long story behind this about how her claim to be the first person to have observed this particular comet was uh, verified and the um, the amount of effort that went on from Harvard College to show that she deserved to be recognized as the discoverer of this comet, um, as a result of which she was awarded one of the medals uh, that um, the King of Denmark gave for people who were the first discoverers of comets. Um, there was a period in, in the middle of the 18th century when cometary discovery was just um, regarded as, as one of the great things that, um, uh, that the people, that astronomers needed to do. So she got her medal. She became very famous. At one point, she was said to be the most famous woman in the whole of the United States. And she was the first woman to be, appoint, um, to be appointed professionally to work as um, doing astronomical work. Um, and uh, and then she was um, headhunted, as we would say now, to become the first professor of uh, astronomy when Matthew Vassar founded Vassar College for Women. And she, um, after a bit of uh, umming and ahhing on her part, she took on the post um, in uh, 1865 and remained there until she had to retire with ill health within a year of of her death in uh, 1889 and um, she uh, founded a great kind of dynasty of women professors so since her time every successive professor of astronomy at Vassar College had been a, a woman and was still a woman when uh, Vera was looking around for somewhere to go to go to college and of course it had an observatory and importantly it was a place where you could you could major in astronomy so um, uh, that it, it seemed an ideal place for her, and I'm putting it that way. Yeah.
But, but uh, viewers' first encounter with physics uh, oh, at yes. school was not a nice experience, to say the least. It was a, actually a very unpleasant experience uh, for her. Um, it was because of the teacher, right? And uh, actually, right. it had also quite a lasting impact on her later during her studies. It, it, indeed, uh, this was uh, Vera's first real kind of encounter with um, male prejudice <laughs> and I think I have to say uh, it was probably quite rife at that at that time. Uh, she describes how um, very graphically how in an early lesson in, in, in physics um, the, the teacher was trying to explain the nature of science um, and he said that there were two different ways in which um, uh, you, you could be good at science. One was to be full of imagination and uh, uh, and to be a, a sort of great ideas. Uh, and the other was just to, to work hard. You, you were very, very diligent and you, you would get there eventually. And um, he quoted the example of the of the, the brilliant kind of scientists as men. And the, and the one example that he gave um, as the woman uh, who was just diligent, was, believe it or not, Marie Curie, despite the fact that she had won two Nobel Prizes. Um, well, I think apart, uh, there must have been more to it about his attitude. Um, I think, uh, Vera describes how she was completely enraged by this. <laughs> yes. um, so these sowed the seeds, I think, in her mind of um, of being a very determined young woman um, who wasn't going to stand for this. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, so she, sadly, though, she describes how she um, withdrew into herself and didn't participate in the, the physics classes because she felt that, the, that they were a macho boys club, as she put it. Um, and uh, on the day she left, she plucked up the courage to say to this uh, teacher, well, I'm going to Vassar College, I've got a scholarship. And uh, his parting remark was, you should be all right as long as you keep away from science. <laughs> Can you believe it? But it did have an impact on um, Vera because during her first year at college, um, she couldn't bring herself to take any courses in physics, which seemed she she was able to distinguish between what she called astronomy and what she called physics. And she didn't want to go to a college where the only possibility was to major in physics. It had to be astronomy because the word physics had almost become toxic for her. And um, by her second year in college, she realized that she probably did have to do something that was called physics so she could concentrate on the aspects of physics that astronomers really needed to know about. But many, many years later, when she was doing a, an interview about her life, she confessed. She said, you know, I don't think I've ever liked physics. <laughs> and she said that she did not like being called an astrophysicist. She said, I'm not an astrophysicist, I'm an astronomer. So it went that deep. Um, and yet, of course, everybody would recognise that a lot of what she did do was physics, in fact, but she didn't like it being under that label. <laughs> mm -hmm. mm, while at college, she met uh, Bob Rubin, who was not just a boyfriend and then, of course, uh, her husband, but he was truly her soulmate, wasn't yes. he? Yes, Vassar College, of course, was all female. She met Bob um, through... Uh, where she lived. Um, his, uh, his parents lived ne near to her parents and they were introduced through their, their parents um, uh, when uh, Vera still had a year to go uh, on uh, Bob's education would have been uh, um, disrupted by the war. Um, he was studying at Cornell University but it appeared that they clicked at first sight though Vera said that the, <clears throat> when he was introduced as this is this is our son and he's at Cornell, but the first question she asked him apparently was, oh, do you know Richard Feynman, who of course was a very, very distinguished physicist. So the very first thing she wanted to know <laughs> was about 
um, about uh, Richard Feynman. Anyway, despite that rather unromantic first remark, they they hit it off immediately. Um, and within three months, um, they knew they were right for each other and announced their engagement. Um, uh, Vera was still, was still rather young. I think she was only 19 at the time. And um, however, um, as soon as she graduated, um, they were married and um, uh, they were proved to be an exceedingly happy marriage. Bob himself, um, though not as prominent as Vera, was a very, very good scientist um, um, in multiple disciplines. Um, he, uh, physical chemistry, mathematics, and um, uh, he supported Vera quite a bit um, with her early research. In fact, you, um, you can see that in her early papers, she acknowledges the help that she got from, um, from Bob. And Bob also recognised Vera's potential and her talent. It was incredibly supportive of um, trying to enable them to both to fulfil what they wanted, which was to have a large family and to have successful scientific careers. And they, they ultimately succeeded in that. Yes, yes, exactly. Mm. Yes, uh, after uh, Vassar, uh, Vera was studied at Cornell uh, University and the title of her master's thesis was Evidence for a Rotating Universe as Determined from an Analysis of Radial uh, Velocities of External Galaxies. And according to what you write in your book uh, at the beginning of the 1950s, um, this um, such a topic for a master's thesis was quite a bold undertaking. Why? Well, it, it, it was indeed, um, and I should set the context, obviously having married Bob, um, Vera was a bit restricted in where she could go and do a, 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 a graduate course. And uh, so she, they obviously wanted to be together at Cornell. Uh, so there wasn't, um, it was a small uh, astronomy department, not very distinguished at the time much more distinguished later. Um, and uh, so she signed on for a one year master's course and part of the requirement was to write a short uh, thesis on something uh, original. And um, yeah, so she chose this theme. Um, we think that it was inspired by a, a, an article that had been uh, published in the scientific journal Nature by the, uh, the, the great physicist George Gamow, who later became um, her own um, uh, advisor. Uh, yeah. But um, we think that's where she probably got the idea from. But although she says herself, in retrospect, she doesn't know why. Um, my suspicion is that um, Bob pointed this out to her, in fact, and she decided because it fitted in with what she'd been learning about our own galaxy. She was very, in, back to the rotation and the movement of the stars, not now because of the Earth's rotation, but because of the real rotation of our galaxy. And she got very interested in how you could track the real movements of the stars in, in space. And that there was a way of analyzing this um, if you knew how far away the stars were and how fast they were moving across the sky. In, in real terms. Um, uh, so, um, so she was, she wanted to pick this up. Um, she could see there was the, the possibility of picking up the idea that Gamow had thrown out and seeing if she could apply the same mathematical techniques to the, the whole universe. Well, of course, what was the whole universe? I mean, it's extraordinary now to think that um, even um, in the late 1940s, early 50s, so little was known about the the um, extragalactic universe. Um, it, it's extraordinary because there'd been a huge gap with the war, with the, with the Second World War, where astronomy had nearly stood still. But um, people were beginning to observe uh, more distant galaxies. They had the telescope, you've got the 200 inch opened and uh, at Palomar in California and bigger telescopes were becoming available. Um, 
but um, very little was known about the extragalactic universe. Um, and when <clears throat> Vera came to look, find um, what published data um, there the, the were on um, what to help her with what she proposed to do, it was extremely limited. Um, uh, in, in fact, she was only able to find data on 108 galaxies. Now, when you think about the millions that we know about now, um, uh, we could see that it was a bit of a hopeless task, but at least she had the imagination to do it. And, and as a young student and relatively inexperienced, it was extraordinary, really, that she should have chosen an extragalactic topic at all when so little was known about the extragalactic universe. And it, um, uh, so, uh, of course, uh, it was something that then became what possessed her for the rest of her life, her interest in, in galaxies. But uh, yes, so she was enterprising. She got what information she could and she came up with, a, um, uh, with an answer. <laughs> yes. Now, there is a, um, a kind of an intriguing story, if I may use this adjective, in your book concerning the thesis and um, the um, master's exam. William Shaw, who was one of the members of the examination committee, approached Vera uh, after the exam, and he had three, basically three things to say to her. First of all, the word data is plural, not singular, as she had mistakenly uh, used it. Um, second, her work was sloppy. And third, uh, she should consider presenting her paper at an American Astronomical Society's meeting, or rather, uh, since she was uh, soon to become a mother, she was pregnant at that time, he, um, mm, he could do it, but not with her as the author, but in his own name. So um, I must say, mm, probably I would be really shocked uh, in such a situation. <laughs> what was her reaction? <laughs> well, yes, um, uh, he had not reckoned with Vera. Um, v Vera, with great presence of mind, said, oh, I can do it. Um, if, even though she knew that the meeting would be um, about three or four weeks after she was due to give birth. Um, she said she she had no idea how she was going to do it, but she certainly wasn't going to let him get away with uh, with this. Um, yes, William Shaw is the professor in the, this small department uh, and the chair of the, the small department. Um, the, there was a woman on the staff, uh, Martha Starr Carpenter, who actually supervised her work more 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 closely and was fairly supportive of her. So um, in fact what happened was that Martha Starr Carpenter um, submitted the paper on behalf of, uh, of Vera so that she could um, present it um, herself. Uh, and, um, uh, and indeed she did and um, once again the, the family uh, um, came to the rescue. Uh, uh, fortunately, the meeting was near where um, she had uh, her family. Uh, her parents and Bob, of course, were uh, always uh, there to, um, uh, to, to support her. So uh, she was only about 20 or um, 21 at the time. And um, uh, apparently she learned later that the, the uh, the committee of the American Ast Astronomical Society debated quite a lot about whether to let her give this presentation because she was so young, unknown, and out of 49 uh, presentations they were going to hear at the meeting, only two were on extra galactic subjects. And that goes to emphasize why this was, um, you know, why she was as we say, sticking her neck out, it really was quite yes. a, 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 an amazing thing that she'd, that she'd done. But they agreed to let her speak. Um, and it was a formative experience for her because there were a number of prominent astronomers in the audience who were taken by her obvious um, you know, intuition, her, uh, her enthusiasm and her, 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 her latent ability. Um, who later gave her great, great encouragement. So it was actually quite important to her that she gave this, this talk. But yes, she, um, uh, it, it was yet another example of um, 
how uh, men can be prejudiced. I mean, I have to say, I, and I think I put this in my in the book, that I do wonder whether William Shaw had really, um, really meant to be so insulting or whether he thought that he was being helpful in some sense. But it was just the attitudes of the time. You know, that, that, was, that was how people thought. Uh, they couldn't imagine that a young woman who just gave him birth was going to go and um, stand up and talk at a scientific meeting. It was just sort of, <laughs> he couldn't conceive of that idea at all. So he, he may have thought he was being helpful, who knows. Um, yes. but, um, but she never did get on with him. I think, again, um, like the physics teacher at school, she found him a bit distant, not able easily to remote to a woman student. Although um, in her records at Cornell University, which uh, I was lucky enough to be able to, to see, um, there is a report in which he actually speaks of her in quite glowing terms. So um, uh, he, if he couldn't bring himself to say it to, his, to her face, um, he, he obviously thought quite highly of her. <laughs> yes, and um, George Gamow, uh, whom you mentioned a few minutes ago, um, a, a Russian-born outstanding scientist, uh, was an influential figure in her uh, scientific career. In your book, you provide some insight into his career and quite a fascinating mm, personality. What was the relationship uh, between Vera and uh, Game of like? Well, this is quite complicated about how she got to, to know Game of. Um, uh, she got to know Game of originally through um, uh, Bob's uh, work. Um, he went to work at the Applied Physics Laboratory of Johns Hopkins University uh, and it was, um, uh, it's quite a complicated, I won't probably, haven't got time to go into all this today, but um, that was how Gamow became aware of what Vera had done um, uh, in terms of her uh, master's thesis and he was a bit intrigued because he obviously recognised that she picked up on his his theme about was the universe rotating uh, and, and so on. So um, she'd met Gamow before she actually went off to do her her doctorate because there was a there was a space between finishing at Cornell and being able to enrol um, to do her PhD a period where she didn't really know how how to take her career forward. But um, so that was how she first encountered Gamma. And then she enrolled at Georgetown University uh, to do a PhD. Um, it was a place where she could um, study in the evenings. Um, the, the lectures were given in the early evening and she was able to study at night and and be a, a, a full-time mum during the day, which didn't leave much time for sleeping. And she said that she was completely exhausted most of the time. Yes. But she, I don't know where she got her energy from, but. Yeah, exactly. She, <laughs> but she but she did, and, and, and she wasn't prepared to settle for things that she didn't want to do. Um, the, the nature of the, the research that was done at, um, at Georgetown didn't really appeal to her. Um, it was suggested that she might do something on the solar spectrum and um, that that just didn't um, make it for, for, for Vera who, who was quite clear she was interested in, in galaxies and um, uh, she was a bit short of a, uh, a thesis advisor and she had the bright idea that maybe um, Gamow would be an exciting person. Um, and so she asked the uh, the director of the observatory and the chair of the department at Georgetown, um, uh, Father Hayden, um, whether uh, they could approach Gamow. And um, now Gamow, uh, a complex character. In fact, I have to say that my my husband is my co-author on this book, who wrote some of the chapters on Vera's research. Is very currently um, uh, very interested in Gamow, and um, he's contemplating uh, whether he should be writing a, a life of Gamow as well now. So, <laughs> um, uh, 
uh, I'm not sure whether I should have said that, but uh, uh, but he has just written quite a big paper um, on uh, on Gamow, which will be in a, a history of in physics um, uh, publication. So he's got really into into this. So I've been learning a bit even more than I found out from Vera about his very interesting history and complex character. Um, a person of um, incredible intuition, um, great ideas. But um, one of his failings was he didn't really like doing the detailed calculations. And we're talking about an era before the electronic computer. So um, if he could get a student to um, do the, the hard and boring bit, which involved lots of mathematical calculations, he was, he was always up for that. So um, he, I think he saw, the, uh, he saw in having Vera as a student um, uh, this opportunity to, uh, uh, to get somebody to do the boring bit of a, a work on one of his great ideas. Uh, and uh, so indeed that's that's what happened um, and he, he he was a bit obsessed at the time about turbulence in the universe being a, um, a source of, um, uh, of rotation or, or a way in which you could form galaxies um, so uh, so yes yeah, so he took her on as, as a student and um, I'm not sure that she got a great deal from him. In fact, apart from, in the end, he did he, he did help her get the thesis published, um, and uh, she said that the meetings with him were not that frequent and not that that helpful. Really, um, he he led a complicated personal life. He was going through a um, a marriage breakup. He was a heavy drinker. Um, and all of this is well known about about Gamow. Um, but uh, it, it, she she certainly tackled a very challenging mathematical thesis, um, and uh, she did need some some help uh, with the mathematics there. She had to go and get. She was tutored by one of Bob's um, colleagues at um, uh, the Applied Physics Laboratory to to get through this math. And um, in the end, well, it wasn't all that consequential. Somebody else had tried to do the same calculations and they all more or less came to the same conclusion that it, it didn't lead anywhere. <laughs> so, but she got her PhD out of it. And, um, and I don't think that she subsequently had really very much more engagement with, with, with Gamow. She admired him greatly, but um, I don't think... Uh, her engagement with him directly was not that, that great. But again, she had this experience of um, uh, Gamow wanting to talk about her, her work at a seminar at APL. And it wasn't, um, he had a bit of a penchant for doing this, of, of talking about other people's work as if it was his own. But, but it wasn't so much that he wouldn't have allowed Vera to himself to, to go and, and, and give one of these seminars at APL. Um, but women weren't allowed, well, wives weren't allowed to go. I mean, this was the extraordinary thing that as um, the wife of an employee, Bob, um, she wasn't allowed over the threshold. I mean, that was extraordinary because this was not just to do with women. It was to do with um, um, what they saw as you know, ne nepotism or or, um, or possibly just a, a blanket rule of we don't want family coming in and um, uh, disturbing our employees. So when she wanted to go and get tutored in mathematics, she had to get special dispensation to be allowed over the threshold and pass the reception um, because she was married to Bob. <laughs> so I don't know whether that answers your question. But, uh, <laughs> Mm, in 19, 1965, she teamed up with uh, Kent Ford at um, the Carnegie Institution. And um, at that time, Ford had been working on uh, a device called Image Tube. Uh, yeah. um, what is an Image Tube? Because this is, some, okay. this is an important element of the story of, of their um, research. Yes, indeed. Um, Vera moved from Georgetown University to 
uh, the Carnegie institutions, what at that time was called the Department of Terrestrial Magnetism for historical reasons. Uh, it isn't now, it's part of Carnegie Science and it's the Earth and Planets Laboratory, same premises, but under a different title. Um, and uh, she, she was determined to kickstart her own research career. She didn't want to carry on teaching as she was at Georgetown. So she worked, she marched in there and said, um, can you give me a job? <laughs> Again, <laughs> the ever courageous uh, um, Vera doing something a bit shocking especially as they'd never employed a woman. Um, anyway, uh, again, she impressed them and she got the job because Kent Ford had been working there. He was an instrument specialist. And what they'd been, um, this department uh, of Carnegie had been um, part of a consortium developing um, electronic means of detecting light. I mean, we're familiar with this now because everybody's got um, a, a digital camera, uh, uh, they, they're ubiquitous, they're, every, they're everywhere, we don't think twice about it. But those of us who are a bit older, we can think back to the days when to take a photograph, you needed to put film in a camera and then have the film developed and so on. It's not that long ago. Um, and when, of course, that's, that's the way astronomy was done. It was, um, you have photographic, not necessarily film, but glass plates, with the, that needed to be developed when they've been exposed. Um, and one of the great limitations is um, uh, how much light you need to make to expose the photographic plate. So if you're looking at something very faint, um, you've got to wait a long time um, for all the photons of light to come and, 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 and register on the photographic plate. Well, suppose you could do that a lot more efficiently. Suppose every single photon of light that's coming in, or most of them, could be detected in some way. And there is a way of doing that, and that instead of um, going straight onto the photographic plate, you could detect the effect that they have or um, in a special detector, that they can produce electrons, the particles, electrons. Um, um, and so um, it was uh, it was a way of enhancing the performance of a photographic plate. You first of all had this electronic device, and then at that time you still had to record everything on a photographic plate because what you got out of it was an electric signal. And, um, and so that had again to be converted into a photograph. So it was a sort of halfway house. It's not like the digital cameras we have now. We didn't have, they didn't have CCDs, but it was a way of amplifying the signal and amplifying a two dimensional image. Um, so what it did was enable um, the users of this facility to be able to do things ten, around say 10 times faster. So what might've taken you 60 minutes to expose on a telescope, took you six minutes if I can give an egg, just a, an example. Well, this uh, meant that even with a, a more modest telescope without not using the 200 inch on Panama, you could get similar results um, for particularly for taking the, the spectra of galaxies and stars and so on. And so, um, Vera was hired to be the astronomer who was going to work alongside the, the developer of the instrument to sort of prove how you could use this instrument properly for astronomy and what would it, which benefits it needed to be tested and proved. So she was hired really to do that, that job. Um, and of course, it was the start of a, um, a career long uh, partnership with Kent Ford, who was the instrument specialist. She was the um, the astronomer uh, making some more decisions about what kind of programs that they should observe and so on. But they worked together for several decades until Ken Ford uh, retired. And the, um, of course, the image tube was was improved. It was used on quite a lot of different different telescopes. And indeed, it did did give um, Ford and Rubin the the edge over what many other people were trying to do in terms of, of observing the um, uh, observing galaxies, in particular getting a spectrum of a faint galaxy or 
as in case of the very first program they did, which was to look at the nearest spiral galaxy, um, uh, the, the great galaxy in Andromeda. They were looking at individual glowing gas clouds they, because it was sufficiently near that they could focus um, the, the slit of the of the spectrograph onto a, an individual gas cloud. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's not possible with more distant galaxies. Uh, you have to look at the galaxy across the galaxy as a whole. But um, uh, yeah, so so they were able really to steal a march on on others who didn't have access to that that, that equipment. Although it, the whole idea of developing the image tube had been to make it available to many observatories. They weren't trying to keep it to themselves. So it, it did then, of course, spread and it was available to a lot more, more astronomers. And of course, um, subsequently it was um, superseded by other um, mm -hmm. electronic imaging means. Mm -hmm. In the 1970s, um, this, this is uh, the um, really important um, decade. Um, Vera Rubin and Ken Ford, they began to investigate the rotation curves um, of spiral uh, galaxies. And that's when they noticed um, something really peculiar about the velocities of stars, um, right? Um, well, uh, they began to collect a lot more evidence about something that <clears throat> actually <clears throat> there's been a suspicion about beforehand but not enough evidence um, yeah. and it's it's to do with the way galaxies rotate and now the example that's usually given is think about how the planets go around the sun and um, the, the planets nearest to the sun go around very quickly and the ones farthest away go around very very slowly and take a very very long time to go now if you plot a graph a simple graph of saying how far away is the planet and how fast does it move, um, th that graph trails off. Um, it, it's, it starts as a, at a high level at the middle, nearer to the sun, and then it trails off. <clears throat> now, people have begun to find with some um, galaxies that um, uh, rather than looking like that, um, however, far out from the centre of the galaxy that it could get and measure how fast the stars were going around the centre of the galaxy, they were still going at the same speed. <clears throat> now, what, what could possibly explain this? Um, this is all in the jargon is said to be a flat rotation curve. But what it meant was that the stars on the outer parts of the galaxy were going around far too fast for expectations. Yes. Um, so there had to be some sort of explanation. But up to the early 1970s, the, the amount of data, the amount that was known about um, the rotation of, um, of galaxies was um, or sufficiently, sufficiently far out, should I say, from the centre of the galaxy. Um, th there was a fair amount of information that, that um, Margaret and Geoffrey Burbage had worked on getting um, the rotation of the inner parts of galaxies, but not going out to the outer parts of, of galaxies. So th there was a shortage of this information. Um, but the other side of the coin is that, of course, that wasn't well, the reason why dark matter in the universe had first been suggested because yes. that goes right back to um, Fritz Zwicky in the 1930s. Yes. And what he had noticed was something, a completely different phenomena. And that was that looking at um, clusters of galaxies, um, why did the clusters of galaxies not fly apart? Why did these clusters still, still exist? Well, it, was, it was always like it was glue holding them together. And so he suggested that the, there's something unseen and it, uh, that had a, a gravitational pull to keep these galaxies together. And he, he invented this, this word dark, dark matter. So it was first a different kind of observation. Now, so now in the 19, early 1970s, there are a handful of people finding, measuring a few individual galaxies and finding that they got 
flat rotation curves. But it's a not it's not a lot of data, and and nobody really had an explanation. I mean, they really they really didn't have an explanation. They weren't looking for the they weren't looking for Zwicky's dark matter really. Um, but the big um, uh, development was a theoretical one in mid uh, the early 1970s, um, and this was um, uh, chiefly um, James Peebles and um, Jeremiah Ostreicher who were doing theoretical work on why do galaxies hang together? If you've got a lot of rotating stars, why don't they fly apart? And basically they came to the conclusion that they too must have glue holding them together. There's something was there. The, the, the most likely astrophysical explanation was that there was matter there that they couldn't see, that we couldn't see. But um, uh, what was the nature of that matter? Initially, the idea was, well, it must be something that's, that's pretty straightforward. But we just don't, we just can't see it because it's very faint stars or something. I mean, people used to joke, well, maybe galaxies were full of old house bricks or old rubbish or whatever you know, um, we, that we couldn't see because it's just all there in small pieces. But of course, we now know that, um, uh, we now know sufficient to know that none of those kind of explanations worked. and. Um, <clears throat> most popular at uh, current time is that it's some kind of uh, basic particles of nature that um, we uh, that, that still remain mysterious to us, but they have this quality of um, uh, of, of gravity. So um, Vera was meanwhile was um, interested just in how galaxies rotate. I mean, the whole concept of dark matter hadn't really sort of filtered through. This wasn't what she was doing. She was thinking, we observe that galaxies look different. Um, we've got tightly wound galaxies, we've got loosely wound, wound spirals. Um, why is this? Why, why are galaxies different? How do they evolve? And she regarded herself as an observational astronomer, that, that what she liked doing was being in the dome and observing and getting in data and getting it to a very high standard. That was what she liked doing. And um, she thought she could make a big contribution if with the image tube and her, um, uh, her attention to detail uh, and her enormous stamina, it has to be said, um, she could um, get together more data than anybody else had previously, systematically about different types of galaxies spiral galaxies in particular. So <clears throat> this was the program she set up. And so what, what happens is that she finds that, that many of the, uh, or nearly all of the rotation curves that she, she gets um, uh, are, are, have this flat form uh, and suggest that, um, that this kind of fits in now with what the theorists are saying. And um, so uh, she, her, her evidence came to be quite important in um, uh, persuading people that indeed the galaxies are surrounded by big halos of, of, of dark matter. But it has to be said, in fairness, that she wasn't the only one doing um, re relevant work that uh, radio astronomers were doing it too. Uh, yes. and, um, <laughs> but the thing was that radio astronomy was still in its relative infancy in, in the 1970s. And um, what radio astronomers did remained a great mystery to most optical astronomers. And they didn't know how to interpret the work of radio astronomers, really. They, they just saw Radio astronomy was something that radio engineers did. It, and, and this was a fair criticism because a lot of the people engaged in radio astronomy didn't know a lot about astronomy, if I can put it that way. They were instrument people, but that was changing. And so um, uh, there were also um, significant evidence coming from radio astronomers, but it didn't do quite so much perhaps to persuade um, the populace of astronomers at large, the community of astronomers at large, 
that um, what uh, the theorists were saying could indeed be explained um, uh, by uh, th these massive halos. And what was more, that they were ubiquitous. They were everywhere. Nearly every galaxy seemed to have one um, because Vera alone um, did the work on um, 50 odd or, or however many it was, you know, she had brought up the, the uh, huge numbers of them and her work was convincing. She published clear papers that people could understand. Exactly. She, she actually never claimed really that she discovered, she had discovered dark matter. She, oh. but it, it's all, of course, it's true. She, that her um, calculations became the first uh, persuasive results supporting the theory of dark matter. She also, um, as far as I remember, she also never um, said that she uh, pursued investigation into dark matter, but she in actually investigated, as you have already said, um, yes. the rotation of galaxies, right? That, that, is, that is true. And she never really wanted to be drawn on the nature of dark matter. She regarded that as something um, for others. It was not it was not um, what interested her. She liked to be observing. And um, she said if she would feel that she'd done her job if people in the future for decades uh, to come would accept that her data was accurate. Of course, ultimately, even her data has been super, uh, has been superseded by um, a, a, a more powerful observations, more accurate observations. But uh, but uh, but yes, yeah, so it was a very important thing she did. An important um, part of her career, of her life, uh, was being uh, an outspoken champion uh, of women's rights uh, um, in science and uh, in uh, in science institutions. Uh, so, uh, what? Uh, um, what did she actually do to support uh, women in science? And um, what uh, encouraged her to become really active in that area, in that field? Well, as we've already discussed, um, uh, Vera um, had already, as a, as a young woman, become very clear that um, uh, it wasn't that easy to be accepted as a woman scientist. Uh, the, the, she was having to um, plow up. She was having to be a, a pioneer. Um, and uh, of course, it took her quite a long time to establish her own uh, career because uh, she did want a, a big family. She eventually had four children uh, and um, there was a limit to what she could do. She she needed to work near to her to her home and Bob's home. She uh, so it took a while. She was later than many young career people would be now in establishing herself. So she was in her forties really before she was beginning to get a name for herself as a, um, uh, a, a for her professional work and so on. And she, so she, before she was in her 40s, she didn't really have the confidence to speak out on, on, on things. But, but that began to change after she was publishing papers and getting a bit more, bit more recognised. Um, uh, and uh, so one of the earliest things we actually have um, from, uh, from her papers, which I went through in the uh, Library of Congress in uh, Washington, was a letter that she wrote them to Nature Journal, where she picked up that um, there was an advertisement for a job in in Australia. Uh, it wasn't in astronomy; it was, but it was a science appointment. And the thing that caught her attention was that uh, this advertisement said that if a woman was appointed, they'd be paid less than a man. Now, of course, this was tr this was true in Australia at that time. It, it changed subsequently, um, but this is 1970. Uh, and she wrote this ironic letter to the editor saying that um, uh, that uh, this was clearly prejudicial against men because any sensible employer would want to employ the best person who was going to cost them the least. So, of course, it would be preferential for them to appoint a woman who was going to be paid a, a, a lower salary. 
uh, so that this was um, clearly it was um, prejudicial against men. Um, and um, uh, and then she furthermore sort of added, and you, know, you shouldn't be publishing adverts, adverts like this and so on. Um, I know about this letter because it was in the file. It was never published. <laughs> uh, and she got a short, short answer from the editor of Nature saying, dear Dr. Rubin, um, we're all um, we're in favour of women's lib, but um, not all our readers think as you do. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> anyway, that, that, that's um, that really showed what ha her approach always was. Um, that she was full of humour. She, she she made her point with humour, irony and logic. Very important. Yes. She used logic. But so um, the thing that really changed matters was um, uh, an action by uh, Margaret Burbage, the other great woman astronomer of her generation. Margaret Burbage, British uh, by, uh, by birth, but had moved to the United States uh, to pursue her career and a few years older than Vera. So Vera looked up to her and Vera had, been, had worked with her um, in the 1960s, um, very much as a junior a junior partner. And Margaret Burbage set, um, uh, sent um, shockwaves through the astronomy community when she turned down an award that the American Astronomical Society gave that was restricted to women. And um, she said, the time has come to stop this discrimination, either in favor of or against women. And, um, uh, um, and uh, she said the prizes should be all be competed for on the same basis. The fear was among women that, that since there was a special prize for women, um, they wouldn't be considered for more prestigious prizes that were, um, would then go to go to men. Um, but this, it did cause a shock um, and the American Astronomical Society had to react because Margaret Burbage was sufficiently distinguished by that point, distinguished enough that they wanted to give her a prize. Um, and Vera um, felt kind of um, uh, that, that she now felt that she could follow on and have the confidence that her um, that she could say how she felt. Um, the American Astronomical Society invited comments on what they should do about the prize and so on. And and and, and so it, it opened the floodgates for Vera to come forward and say what she what she felt and how angry she'd already been feeling about the fact that the uh, the council of the society was all men that they'd even offered to reserve places for young astronomers, but they still didn't have any women because they hadn't reserved any places for women and they weren't putting forward women for election um, and so on. And um, she felt really very cross about this. Um, the outcome of all this episode was ultimately the American Astronomical Society set up a standing committee. It was initially an investigating committee and then it turned into a standing committee, which still exists on the, the Committee on the Status of Women in Astronomy, and that still exists. And, and Vera was active with the first women who set that up, although she didn't, she was too busy doing many other things to carry on with that, that went into the, the, the hands of others. So um, uh, that, that was important for her. And very shortly afterwards, again, I, a, a thing that the, the family always thought was a great thing that she did, was her battle with the Cosmos Club in Washington. The Cosmos Club in Washington, which still exists, um, was um, a, a club um, to which the great and the good belonged, you know, the people who were in uh, the top level of the law and science and politics and so on. Um, but it was only open to men, of course, at that time. Um, however, um, it had a lecture room at the back of its premises um, uh, where the Washington Philosophical Society um, held its meetings. And she was invited to talk um, uh, at the um, at one of their meetings. Um, and uh, uh, the custom was that the speaker 
would be um, entertained to dinner beforehand in the Cosmos Club itself. Now, the Cosmos Club was um, so curiously uh, male dominated, it didn't even let women in through the front door. There was a, a, a lady's entrance at the back. <laughs> well, you can imagine how Rhea reacted to this <laughs> by now. You know so, so much about her. Anyway, yes, she said that there was no way she was going to be insulted by told that she'd be being told that she'd got to enter the Cosmos Club through the ladies' entrance at the back while the men went in through the front door. And indeed, um, uh, she didn't. Uh, she said she'd happily have dinner with them somewhere else, which they which they did. It wasn't the lecture room actually had a separate entrance, so that that issue. But the whole business about the Cosmos Club then became a big battle. Margaret Burbage joined in with this. Um, she, it was also a place that had meeting rooms and a lot of the organisations, um, even her employer and the, the boards that were running telescopes and so on, you know, they would meet there. And so the women had this campaign saying, we don't want you to meet there. We want you to um, veto any kind of use of this club's facilities until it lets women in. Um, uh, uh, and um, that battle went on till well into the 1980s when they only gave way, gave way when uh, it was clear that, that legally they couldn't continue and they were going to be taken to court. So the, the sort of club finally reluctantly admitted women. But it was <laughs> it was just another example. Um, and of course, as her own um, uh, distinction grew, um, she eventually she was elected to the National Academy of Sciences, which of course was very prestigious for people who are in um, in Britain. That's a bit like being elected to the Royal Society. Um, so that gave her a platform. And again, she she was constantly uh, working on the National Academy of Sciences for saying that they got to have women speakers. If, if she detected a meeting where there were all male speakers, a letter went, um, she was putting forward lists of well-qualified women who she said would be suitable to serve on committees, on boards, to give talks at, at, at meetings and so on. She was just at it the whole time. And, um, and she didn't rest, um, but it took a long time. It really did take a long time. Um, and um, I mean, that's, a, that's sort of an example of, of, of where she was, she was very active. Um, I can't really, you know, I've just given some examples, but yes. in all, all areas where she could perceive that um, women were underrepresented not, and their contributions were not recognized, she was writing and she was writing and and it was it was never a, a, she she said she felt angry but she never sort of ranted she just used this logic the humor the irony all the time and, and she made a really really big impact yeah exactly of course it would be impossible to um uh, to talk about all the initiatives she took uh, in in one interview because there were so many yeah. obviously mm -hmm. she did also support individual women you know she she yes. met people a she mentor, yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. despite that she despite everything she was doing all the boards committees she served on the amount of observing she carried on doing well into her 60s and she still found time for individual people yes uh, which was one of the reasons why she was greatly loved and, and respected as a person. Yes. Mm -hmm. Did she have, did Vera Rubin have a wonderful life? Um, well, I, uh, I, I, th I think so, which is, of course, why um, I call my last chapter Wonderful Life, partly because, in a way, I was trying to bring together um, lots of different things about about Vera's life but what is a wonderful life she seemed very happy and her daughter she had three sons and a daughter <clears throat> um, all of whom were scientists um, yes. Judy her daughter became an astronomer sadly died rather prematurely um, before Vera did um, but um, Judy described Vera's life as a love story 
And um, I think it was a rather beautiful way of putting it, not, not just, uh, I think it was not just the admiration of a daughter, but the admiration of everybody who knew her and um, said that, that her life was um, really governed by her love of family, her love of learning and curiosity and her over, um, overwhelming love of, of, of astronomy. And um, people who knew her said that, um, you know, she just was that sort of person. She gave time for, for other people. Um, but she, she also had lots of wonderful experiences in her life. She forged a career. She could look back on it. She won the highest award in the United States for, for science, the National Medal of Science. She could look back on her life of the wonderful time that she'd spent with her family, um, four children, lots of grandchildren, um, very happy family life uh, and um, recognition, uh, all sorts of exciting things that she did did in her life. And she's, she still said that um, nothing uh, thrilled her more than being in, in, in the dome. <laughs> of course, latterly, astronomers are rarely in the dome. They're always in a warm office somewhere. But um, uh, so, yes. Um, and of course, the final um, accolade is the Vera C. Rubin um, Observatory um, being named uh, for her. Um, uh, uh, after her death as, as a national memorial, the, the only national facility in the United States that's um, been named for a, for a woman. And um, so uh, and so many testimonials from the people who, who knew her about, um, about her life and her as a person. So not just a great scientist, a great woman. Yes, yeah, exactly. A fascinating person, uh, a great scientist, as you say, um, once again, a beautifully, beautifully written, very interesting book uh, on the life and uh, scientific career of Vera Rubin. Uh, thank you so much uh, for talking to me today and Thanks. for sharing so many mm, details, so much, uh, so much interesting, inspiring uh, information, so many inspiring stories. So thank you for accepting my invitation once again. It was a pleasure. Um, it's, I now find it is always a pleasure to talk about Vera. I've learned so much about her myself on with having the opportunity to write this book and she truly is a, um, she remains a, now a, a great source of inspiration for me uh, and I'm constantly thinking back about the things that she would have done what her life was like and it, it remains now a, an ongoing she remains an ongoing inspiration for me yes and for many many other people as well thank you once again <laughs>